Decades ago, I started growing food in my front and backyard, and I realized that my mission in life is to inspire and empower others to grow their own nutrient-dense, healthy, organic food. Because of this, a lot of people have come to me with their gardening questions over the years, and that got me thinking, what if we put together a community that would help budding gardeners blossom? So I finally made the idea a reality with my Urban Farm U member program. Each month, your membership includes three live online events, a monthly class, a chit chat with an expert, and a monthly coaching session, plus access to the experts on our member page and a significant discount on our signature courses. I'm deeply committed to transforming our global food system, and I do this by empowering you to grow your own food. The Urban Farm Membership Program is a simple way to get going. Please join me in transforming your food system today. To learn more, go to urbanfarmmembership.org or text MEMBERSHIP to 33444. That's urbanfarmmembership.org or text MEMBERSHIP to 33444. You're listening to the Urban Farm Podcast, your partner in the Grow Your Own Food revolution. Whether you've just been introduced to urban farming or you're a lifelong advocate, we're sure you'll leave feeling more informed, equipped, and empowered to dig deeper into the soil of your local food economy. With you every step of the way, here's your host, Greg Peterson. Today on the Urban Farm Podcast, we have Catherine Crowley, the herb lady, to talk about her experience on growing culinary herbs. Catherine, the herb lady, is a self-taught, hands-in-the-dirt urban farmer who experiments and researches constantly for new and interesting edibles, as well as playing with old favorites. She was given the nickname, the Herb Lady, when vendors and customers at farmer's markets would say, go ask the Herb Lady for questions on herbs. Then it stuck. Catherine has taught many cooking and gardening classes at various locations private and public, including the notable Boyce Thompson Arboretum, which is an Arizona State Park, and Phoenix's own Desert Botanical Garden. She has been a newspaper columnist for four years, writing on growing and using edible herbs. Catherine has a blog online and is a regular vendor at her local farmer's market. Welcome to the show today, Catherine. Good to be here, Greg. Thank you so much for being here. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at now? My experience has been one where I kind of intentionally chose little by little different plants to try out. Um, I was, a, you know, as uh, you probably mentioned in the uh, in the lead up to this, I was motivated by family issues of uh, low, needing low salt, low oil, and, mm. you know, you get into a no-salt diet and there you lose a lot of flavor. So I was, you know, looking for things to put it back in. Right. Um, I started going with herbs and spices, and I wanted to try growing them, realizing that, yes, I could grow a lot of stuff here. I didn't know at the time when I first started this how much I could grow, that was part of the the future journey. When you've been doing this a long time, haven't you? Yeah, over 30 years. And how did, um, you, how did you get started? I just basically jumped in. I wanted to try to grow, well, you know, the obvious things. I wanted to try to grow basil. Uh-huh. And I think I probably planted, uh, you know, an onion or something. I got intrigued with um, edible flowers and started looking into what flowers are edible and, you know, could I grow them here? And just kind of adding on every time uh, as as I went forward through my journey, Mm -hmm. I I would meet people from new ethnicities to me and I would say to them, um, what uh, what did your grandmother, you know, I, I would say to them, it, it sometimes it caught them off guard, because a lot of times this happened at the farmer's market, and I say, right. what what is your ethnic heritage? And some of the, the people would sometimes step back and look a little leery, because, you know, they were waiting for somebody to drop a shoe on them. Right. 
and I would say to them qu- as quickly as I could, I want to know what your grandparents or your parents grew, what they oh, um, what yeah. they grew to, to use, and that opens up people. I mean, they mm-hmm. want to, as soon as mm-hmm. you tell them you want to talk about their <laughs> heritage, oh, yes. they want to talk to you. Mm-hmm. And so new to me, herbs particularly, and also other vegetables and stuff, were so intriguing to me because I, by this time, had learned how much could be grown here. I wanted to add these new things. Uh Uh, And so it just kind of, I guess you could call it snowballing. (laughs) I love it when that happens. So you actually live here in the desert with us. I do. I've been here since 1976. Wow. And just... I love everything about Arizona. I love the desert. I miss the ocean, you but, <laughs> you know, it's not that far away. Right. I hear you on that one. <laughs> Definitely hear you on that one. So what do you grow? In the gardens right now, I have turmeric, ginger, basil. I've got a couple of different basils, actually. Mm-hmm. I have Syrian oregano. I have Greek oregano. I have Mexican oregano, a couple of different sages. Let's see what else. I've got uh, alpine strawberry beds, um, but we're going to be just talking about herbs. I have a lime thyme. I have a Spanish thyme. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, the lime thyme is really lovely. I have lime-scented geranium, one of my favorite uh, scented geraniums, and uh, they they can be a little fussy. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. but uh, it, it seems to be happy where I've got it now. I'm just kind of walking through my garden right now. Yeah, nice. Um, the, the nasturtiums are starting to come back up. Oh, I yep. consider them an herb because they're part of the mustard broccoli family, so yeah. there are lots of good things in there for you. So tell us about what you do with nasturtiums. I have. If, if I don't know how many of your, uh, our listeners are familiar with Dalma uh, stuffed grape leaves. Oh. Uh, but I have used the giant, because my nasturtium oh. leaves can easily get eight inches across. So I have actually made Dalma with the nasturtium leaves. I've put the flowers in salads, and I've used the immature seed, which is a real nice horseradishy mm-hmm. bite. You know, you can grind that up and put it in a salad dressing, that type of thing. Wow. Uh, yeah, so the the whole plant is edible. It's great. It's pretty. It's delicious. And fun, it sounds like. And and a lot of fun. And they have a nice beneficial aspect. I let them pretty much grow wherever they want to grow in the garden because they are a pest deterrent. Oh, yes. Yes. So, and nicely, they come back year after year after year, don't they? They, they do. They reseed freely and pretty much anywhere they want to go. Yeah. Yeah. I found, I found that um, they just magically come up wherever they want. Mm-hmm. Yes. And so what do they yeah. taste like? Kind of peppery uh-huh. without a real harsh. You know, there's a big difference between the, the bite of horseradish and the bite of capsaicin peppers, you know, the hot peppers, the oh, jalapenos yes. and that type. Yes. So you've got that peppery bite, but without um, a real harshness to it. The seeds have the most heat, if you want to put it that way. Uh-huh. But the flowers and the leaves have just a real nice, oh, mustardy, um mild 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 horseradish flavor so they can give a real nice note to things i've used nasturtium leaves as part of or in place of lettuce on sandwiches oh nice oh oh that's curious Uh uh-huh well they're they're, they're big enough so they'd fill up your sandwich for you oh yes oh yes nice so you've been growing herbs a long time what for somebody that's brand new, what's a good way to get started? What's a simple one to start with? Probably for going into the warm weather, I would say uh, basil, you know, is just one of the easiest ones to start. It really wants to germinate. Uh-huh. Once the soil temperatures warm up, it's one of those that likes its feet warm and benefits from the long daylight hours going into the warm weather. Mm-hmm. So basil is probably the easiest one in, in full sun. In the ground, preferably, if you can, or a very large, I always recommend a minimum of a 20-inch wide pot if you're going to container garden. Right. And then just plant in the center of the pot, and you can put in edible flowers around it, too. So basil would be the good one for the, um, for the 
the uh, summertime going into the warm weather. And right. then if the people are thinking this time of year, yep. cilantro, coriander oh. germinates very well yes. going into the cool weather. They're the opposite of basil. They like their feet cool and they can tolerate the lower oh, yes. daylight hours of the winter. So hold on here. For, for our listeners that don't know, you just mentioned two herbs. Right. The cilantro and the coriander. Right. Tell us about yes. that because they're not. Yeah. Yes, and and it's it's interesting because it's one of the few culinary herbs where the seed tastes dramatically different from the leaf. Oh, yes. So coriander has a very unique the the seed is a hard round uh seed. Oh, I don't know what size you would call it. Maybe a, uh, an eighth of an inch. Uh-huh. It's one of the bigger herb seeds and it has a very distinctive Spice. I mean, you, you can taste that it's a spice um, rather than an herb as, as in a green herb, whereas the cilantro has, a lot of people don't know what the back notes are, but it's kind of a citrusy back note. And oh, interesting. interesting. Yeah, and interestingly enough, the leaf, uh, the cilantro leaf and the basil <clears throat> leaf are deemed to be, in order, the least favorite and the most favorite of herbs worldwide, according to a study uh, survey that was done some years ago. Basil was the most popular herb in the world, and uh-huh. cilantro was the least. Least, yeah. I can get that. I I cannot touch cilantro when it's fresh. I can't pick it because it just, it drives me nuts. Uh-huh. Now, I, yeah. like a, I like a little bit of it in my salad or, right. you know, in salsa or in, in food, but you know the 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 oils in it just the, they don't do me. <laughs> yeah, well, and and it truly is a love it or hate it herb. You know, you ask people if they've ever had cilantro, and you're going to get it. There's no gray area. Yeah. they're either going <laughs> to love it or they're going to hate it. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So you said something that is quite curious, and I'd like you to speak to it, and that's spices versus herbs. This is one of those, the difference between a, a bug and an insect type of, a, of, of an answer. Uh-huh. So um, all herbs are spices, but not all spices are herbs. Oh. In that an herb is generally considered to be the leafy part of the plant, uh. um, whereas a spice is the seed, the stem, uh, the root, the, in other words, the dried matter yeah. of the plant. So what is the single biggest challenge for, for new gardeners in growing herbs? I, I think it probably applies to herbs and everything else. They, but they basically start out by saying, well, we can get really hot here in the desert, uh-huh. for instance, as an example. So uh, therefore, everything has to be shaded. Mm. And that, that is probably one of the biggest um, tr- uh, mental traps, maybe, uh, is, is a way to put it, that people get themselves into. They'll. Uh, I have people ask me questions all the time. They come up to me at lectures and the farmer's market and say, I tried this and it didn't work. And mm-hmm. my questions range from, you know, what, what did you grow it in the ground? Did you grow it in a pot? Did, right. where, did, did, was it in the sun? What did you do? And almost un- universally, when somebody is initially having a problem with getting something going and they've tried it a couple times, they're keeping it in the shade. Oh, yes. Well, if if you think about the way that the sun feeds a plant, you know, uh-huh. everyone knows that the term photosynthesis. Well, right. it needs direct access to the sun. Mm-hmm. So it's particularly true with herbs because of the essential oils. It is the essential oils that give the herbs their wonderful aroma and oh, flavor. Yes. Uh-huh. And with and in fact, it's so part of the. It needs to be in the sun aspect that you don't pick herbs on a cold overcast damp day because the essential oils have retreated so the idea that people who are approaching well i'd like to grow basil and i'd like to grow dill and i'd like to grow cilantro so those are things well there's you know the best time to plant these you know for instance in the desert but the other part is getting people to really understand that it needs to be in full sun Mm. It can take a little shade, but basically we're talking about six, eight hours a day, direct sun, year-round. Uh-huh. And that gives them the best, the healthiest plants, 
the ones that are the most aromatic, the most flavorful, right. and the ones that are most likely to do so well that they'll happily recede for you the next season. Cool. So happily recede. Talk about that process, would you? Yeah, most of these herbs will recede if you let them go to the full maturity. Um, and sometimes people have a little problem with that. They don't understand what, what maturity means. Well, basically it means let the plant, plant go to dead. Um, uh, you know, <laughs> right. You know, it, the seed has to dry up. That's the, that's the aspect of harvesting because I, re- I recommend that people try to harvest their own uh, plants for re-sowing the next season, uh-huh. and it's called regional adaptation. There's a couple of reasons for wanting to harvest your own seed. One, you save money. You're yeah. not having to buy the seed again. Two, the regional adaptation means that that plant's seed grown in your own backyard is now more adapted to your particular characteristics of your garden. Gotta and love each it. And each successive generation becomes stronger and stronger. I know that in the valley there are some people are trying to get cilantro, for instance, to be regionally adapted so that it bolts slower in the spring, lasts longer in terms of lush green growth. Uh huh. Well, that's really one of the reasons to do this, so that you're starting to adapt it so that it does essentially what we want it to do in our gardens, right? Exactly. When it's a, it's really a simple process, is it not? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you could, you know, there's really, basically, when you when the plant has flowered, mm-hmm. um, then you're going to be looking for the seeds, you know, and every every herb has a slightly different looking seed right. uh, uh, if they're different uh, species. You know, a sage seed looks different from a basil seed, which looks different from an oregano seed type of thing. Mm-hmm. So you're looking for the seed pod to come out. It's going to be green initially. And then you're going to be looking and watching for it to start to turn brown. You want it to be as dry as possible. But if you reach a point where you have to pull the plant out or you're not sure if it's mostly dried, you can um, pick it and stick. I stick them in brown paper bags, either big shopping bags if I have a huge oh, yeah. bush you uh-huh. know, that I'm trying to preserve. Or, you know, a small lunch bag, you know, brown bag, but always paper. And then you just let it dry for a couple of days in the paper in, away from moisture. Mm-hmm. And you can, I crush the bags a little bit to release the seeds. And if you keep doing that over the course of a week or two, what you have in the bottom of the bag is a lot of dried seed ready wow. to package up. I label everything, um, put them in brown, uh, not brown, but I put them in paper envelopes. And then seeds should be stored just like you store really good spices and dried dried herbs, coffee and tea. Mm-hmm. Uh, cool, dark, dry. <laughs> that's uh, <clears throat> that's uh, Bill and Bell's mantra. Yep, exactly. Bill McDormand, yeah. Cool, yes, dark, yep. and dry, yeah. Yep, yeah. That's the way to uh, keep it going. And then, you know, some of the seeds, um, like the, the coriander for the cilantro, can be used as a spice, but you save some of it for uh, planting next fall. For the garden, exactly. And you don't have to store them, do you? Can you just let them spread in your yard? Uh, absolutely. If you want them wherever they want to drop, then all you have to do is go through and crush the heads um, when you know that they're dry or let the plant uh, go completely dead and then uh, break it off at the soil if you don't want to disturb other plants around the root system. That's one of the things people do have to kind of keep in mind. If they're growing annuals mm-hmm. amongst perennials, you don't want to be digging up and then disturbing the roots on the perennials. Right. So then just wait for the plant to completely die back, break it off at the so- break or cut it off at the soil level, level and then just whack the seed heads along <laughs> the area where you want them. <laughs> <laughs> to grow I will often just grab the dried seed head crush them in my hand and spread it liberally around the yard right exactly and that you know what that gives me is magic happening you know lettuce in the lawn and uh, parsley I, I get parsley forests here every year uh, yes yeah several years ago Dean made the mistake of taking a seeded uh, parsley head across the lawn and the next oh my spring gosh. <laughs> oh yeah next spring he said it smelled like a salad every time he mowed the oh, lawn God. yep 
he he had to dig up about 500 seedlings. Oh man! Um, but but yeah, we've had that. I had uh, celery growing in the lawn this spring. Yep. Well, and I would have just kept the parsley growing in the lawn and then mowed it, and the chickens love that. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I'm I'm hoping to get some uh, hens uh, sometime in the near future. So yeah, we would be letting them do whatever they want to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Perfect. So y you've spoken about density in gardening. Can you speak about that today? Yes. If there was one major thing to help people understand about working with the heat instead of against it, uh -huh. it would be density of planting. The desert garden, you know, where we are working to, to grow our food, is very different from the Midwest or the Northeast. And that the difference is you can do row cropping in those areas. Uh -huh. Row cropping here is usually going to present problems except in the middle of the winter if you're growing certain types of things like carrots and beets and radishes. Those, right. those do well in rows. But if you're trying to do um, going into the summer, if, you're, uh, you know, if you plant your tomatoes and basil on February 1st and you do a little frost protection, uh -huh. you don't want a lot of soil showing people get really worked up about well i'm going to this is back to the shading thing right they need the sun but but they also need some protection and the protection is not on the plant it's on the soil so i call it canopying in the desert some you know in our desert uh People, some people are used to going out into the desert hiking or enjoying a yep. ride, you know, four-wheeling. Right. And they'll see a um, saguaro cactus growing up and through beside a mesquite tree. That's a nurse plant situation yes. where yep. the seed nestled at the base of the tree, was protected from the birds, had enough moisture, was kept in place and shaded until it started to grow up. Well, that's what you're doing with density of planting in our mm -hmm. edible gardens. Right. You don't want any soil surface showing. If you're just planting in young plants or seedlings, then you do light mulch, except that the light mulch should never touch the base of the seedlings. It, right. it's, a, it's, it's a subway tunnel for the pests. So, you know, there's, there's some um, just some challenges. You just don't want it to touch the seedlings. Right. But that's basically it. You don't want soil showing when you're growing in your garden. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're either, either densely planting things like lettuces and onions and basil um, and everything else. You're just letting it grow as close to each other as possible. I, I learned the nurse thing, the density of planting, um, by accident some quite a few years ago. I wanted basil, and it was really the horrible time to plant it. it I was transplanting basil like June 15th. Oh, my gosh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I wanted some. But what I did was I put, put in about six plants, and I did uh, sort of instinctively, I put them all fairly close together. They were in like a 12 or a 14-inch circle, and I just kind of densely oh, planted them all right there. Oh, Nice. Yeah, so over the course of the next several weeks, the obvious happened. Some, some of them started to die, but the ones that didn't die were the ones in the middle that had their side protected by the other plants and the soil was canopied. Hmm. So while w one by one the exterior plants started to drop off, mm -hmm. the interior ones had all of that sun and were growing lush and large and by the time the exterior plants had actually finished dying off, the center one or two plants, I think there were two plants that survived, right. were huge. <laughs> and I, what I want to point out, in permaculture, we call that observation. You observed and figured out what worked in that space. Mm-hmm. Yay. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And that, that, that's also kind of my modus operandi, if you, mm -hmm. if you will. We occasionally talk about failure, and failure is inevitable in the garden. Um, but I kind of instinctively or intentionally built failure into my journey uh, because I wanted to find out where things grew best. Oh, yeah. So I would, if I was, uh, particularly if I was doing something new to me, I would buy three or four or five plants mm. or, or plant sets of seeds 
in different locations in the garden, different sun angles, different uh, moisture levels, right. whether they were in, the, near or far from large things like, my, our, like our trees, and see what did well where. And then I could turn around and help share that information with people about this is what worked. And then similar plants, you know, as I would get more intrigued with other new plants, uh, new to me herbs, you know, talking to, uh-huh. you know, people from other cultures, I would say, well, that one looks just like that one over there. Mm-hmm. So I'll bet it would do well in the same spot, you know, or the same area. And and so, you know, over 30 plus years, I've developed <laughs> uh, some, somewhat of a, of, of a plant instinct, you know, right. like you say, observation mm-hmm. to say, this is probably going to do okay over here. And most of the time, I'm right. But I've got a lot of trowel and error. <laughs> I'm responsible for a lot of green death. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I think that's what part of what makes us good farmers and gardeners, is it not? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I've, I've actually talked to a soil scientist and found it sad mm-hmm. that some of the corporate farmers work from a manual given to them by an oh, end yeah. supplier mm-hmm. who wants to tell them how to grow something mm-hmm. and what to do to get uniform Christmas ball tomatoes and, uh, you know, that type of stuff. Right. And, and, and a soil scientist will say to them, if you do this one more thing, you're probably going to mm-hmm. increase your production, and they don't want to hear it because they're not actually farmers and gardeners. Yeah. They're not people in touch with the soil. I don't I I'm kind of, I'm I hear you and I'm kind of speechless as to what to say to that because there's so much truth to it. Yeah, it just like I said, you know, when I had this conversation, it was sad because my mom grew up on a farm. People uh-huh. in, you know, from gener- and there's lots of good farmers out there. Oh, yeah. I don't want to I want I don't want to make this a, a generalization. There's lots of really wonderful farmers oh, yeah. out there who really understand the soil and what it takes and, and, and how plants grow and, uh-huh. and the, the whole synergy of, of what's going on. And then there's a corporate person who says, okay, I can make a lot of money if I grow yeah. you know, this plant for that corporation. In that particular way, yeah. 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 So now we've grown all of these herbs, what are we going to do with them? Is there a simple way that we can make our own blends? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. One of my favorite ways to help people understand how to make a blend, because, you know, uh, one of the things, of course, one of the questions I get asked a lot or or, uh-huh. or when I'm talking to people and they say, well, I don't know how to use herbs. I've never <laughs> used them. Right. The certain cultures, you know, basically it's butter, salt, and pepper. Right. And so what I say to them is our sense of taste is very much linked to our sense of smell. So I say put an herb or a spice in the palm of your hand, rub it and smell Mm. it. If it smells good to you, it will taste good to you. Ah. And everybody's sense of smell and taste is different. So that's why you wouldn't like cilantro, but somebody else would. Uh So then if you want to build a blend, take another herb and rub it in with the first one and smell it. If it smells good to you, then it will probably Mm. taste good to you. And you can do this with, you know, three, four, five herbs and get your own blend that is Greg's blend and it's his go-to blend for everything. The one thing I would make a recommendation for, if you look at seasonings for sale in the uh, the spice aisle, Uh you'll notice that in many blends, thyme is in there. And there's a reason. It's an anchor herb. It's Uh always used, almost always found in any kind of a blend because it's a little bit uh, oregano, a little bit basil, you know, that it's, mm, it's the essential mm-hmm. oils that cross right. these, um, all of these wonderful herbs. They, they, they are in different combinations within herbs. Like, as an example, marjoram and, oregano, and Greek oregano mm-hmm. are from the same family. However, Greek oregano has a whole lot of carvacol in it, which is also found in thyme, right. but almost none in marjoram. Marjoram has a little bit of a citrus back note, ah. and so it's almost sweeter than biteier, like the oregano. Right. 
Oh, that's very interesting. So then what I hear you say is that really we can make up our own special blends by figuring out what smells and tastes best to us. So that sounds really simple. Yes, it is. You know, it's just a real simple way to um, to make something that really is something that you can always use. You'll know yeah. you know it will taste good. And people think in terms of, you know, you, know, you need a steak blend and you need a chicken blend and oh, you need yeah. a, a, a fish blend. Mm -hmm. And to a certain extent, certainly some herbs and spices blend, bring out the flavor more. Because that, uh -huh. by the way, is the whole point of cooking with herbs and spices. For people who mm. have to take salt and oil and those types of things out of their diet, right. they wind up with these bland food. Well, if you put, as an example, mm -hmm. rosemary goes really, really well with anything starchy. It lifts the flavor oh, of the starchy food. Of course. So, yeah, and so if you put rosemary on something first, and then taste it before you put the salt on. You may find that you lead, need little or no salt to really make that food taste good. We've gotten, unfortunately, post-World War II, uh -huh. we went into hyperdrive in terms of uh, conveniences. Yeah. And we got used to heavy salted foods because when they came out with the frozen foods, the only way to make something that's frozen mm -hmm. taste good coming out of the oven or whatever was to heavily salt it. Right. So we're back to, um, you know, for people who, like us, who want to grow our own whatever whatever food, uh -huh. um, the herbs uh, are, are, this is something that people have to kind of almost retrain their taste uh -huh. um, for. And so one simple one that I tell people to try is if you love a baked potato with butter and, and um, you know, salt, I said, make the baked potato, have some fresh lemon or lime juice on it, um, or grill, it, uh, grill the potato on the, on the grill, break it open, spritz it with a little bit of lemon or lime juice, and sprinkle it with um, rosemary, fresh or dried, right. and, and taste it. You may not miss the salt and the butter. Oh, yeah. Well, okay, maybe the salt, but butter? <laughs> <laughs> I love my butter. Yes. Yeah, I and I do too. I and <clears throat> you know I don't use margarine. In fact, I make my own um, spread uh, with organic butter and avocado or olive oil. Mm -hmm. So now we've grown these herbs and we know how to blend them, and we go out into our garden and we pick some of them. What's your favorite ways of drying them? Um, I have two ways that I dry my herbs, and it depends on the time of year and how much I have. Now, with, the, with uh, a lot of heavy production of the herbs, um, I will dry large batches in the sun. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm just taking advantage of what nature uh -huh. has given us. Um, for small batches, uh -huh. though, I like to dry them in the refrigerator on a paper plate or on really? a paper towel. Um, the, our modern refrigerators uh, uh, operate uh. on a low-density freeze-drying process, constantly yep. removing the moisture. Right. So unlike drying in, you know, people dry them on the, on the counter, they dry them in the microwave, they dry them in the oven. But in the refrigerator, um, the, this mimic, mimicking the freeze-drying process uh -huh. retains more of the color mm. and more of the flavor, basically because heat dissipates the essential oils. Yeah. So let's talk specific herbs. Do you have any particular ones that you like? Um, I have two that have become favorites of mine because they were intriguing to one, grow, uh -huh. or one, find, and two, to grow. Stevia and ser true Syrian oregano. The stevia, I'll talk about that first. Mm -hmm. uh, for anyone who doesn't know, that is the sweet herb. It is naturally sweet, no-calorie herb, native to South America, uh, the tribal people down there mm -hmm. have used it for, oh, about 1,500 years. Wow. Uh, it was discovered by Europeans about 400 years ago. Most people are familiar with stevia in a powder or a liquid form. Right. And it, because it's safe for diabetics, it, it became very popular, was finally legally made a food additive. Uh, several years ago, there was there's a whole lot of chemical company history behind that but the needless to say we can now 
find stevia as the sweetener of choice in ter- certain types of processed foods. Right. Um, however, the liquid and the powder are highly concentrated. Yep. Which for some people create, and the reason for that is to make it sweeter. Exactly. In its natural state, it's 12 to 20 times sweeter than sugar and has a nice clear taste uh-huh. is, is the way I describe it. It allows the food that you put it in or with to come through. Um, without any kind of an aftertaste. Mm -hmm. But when it's highly concentrated, it brings forward a little bit of a naturally occurring slight licorice flavor and can taste bitter to some people. I was going to say it tastes bitter sometimes, doesn't it? Yes, it does. And so I got intrigued. I don't need it. You know, I'm not diabetic. I do have a diabetic nephew, but... Um, I was just intrigued with the idea that you know if you can if if this is a if this is a plant why not grow it yeah um, and so it's a subtropical plant. I happen to live in one of the warmer areas or the milder areas of the valley, and so I've been blessed with a stevia plant that is has come back for about five years. Wow! Um, into a nice lush bush every spring and all the way through into fall. Uh huh. So I can harvest as much stevia as I would like, and it's just it's just so fun. I mean, the very the the funnest thing I have with people who are intrigued with the stevia, the plant, because they're used to the fl- uh, the powder and the liquid, right. is to have them take a piece of the fresh leaf, mm-hmm. the tiniest tiniest pinhead of a piece, and put it in their mouth, and I say bite on it, and everybody gets wide eyed. Oh, exactly. Uh, I know. They I can't believe how sweet it how is. How sweet it is. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a wonderful plant. For anyone who wants to try growing it, I would suggest that you get the transplant. The seeds are notoriously difficult to get to germinate. The Uh recommendation is if you do get seeds, try to germinate, try to focus on the uh, dark brown ones or black ones rather than the light colored ones. They seem to have Uh a slightly better germination rate, but it's still not great. So are you processing this then? Um, I dry it. And one of the wonderful things about stevia dried is this, it, and it, the, the chemical name is stevicide, which makes it sound like it's a poison. <laughs> yeah. You know, but um, the, it is an element, not an essential oil like you find in basil. So it's very stable, very, very stable, hot and cold. In fact, you can if you want to make your own sweet liquid with it to use to flavor drinks, uh-huh. um, you can actually get two steepings out of the same batch like you would reuse uh, a tea bag. Right. Because the element is so stable. And I've got two- and three-year-old dry stevia that tastes just as sweet as the day I dried it. Wow. How cool is that? Then you mentioned another one, Syrian yes. oregano. True Syrian oregano is the is regarded as the true hyssop of the Bible, a, an herb native to uh, the Middle East. It has a distinctive oregano flavor, very different from Greek oregano, and um, the there's been a hybrid that has been uh, grown and sold in the United States for a very long time. And but it was never acknowledged as the true Syrian oregano, and I uh-huh. kept trying to find it. And a couple of years ago, Baker Creek, um, a lot of people know Baker Creek Seeds. Uh, they, it's rareseeds.com. Yep. They were able to acquire a batch of the seed from directly from the Middle East, and I got some and wow. uh, started growing it. It it, it uh, germinated very well. In uh-huh. fact, it's a such a robust plant. I had to cut back the original plant because it was just <laughs> taken over. Nice. Um, it, it's it, it's one of my favorite go-to uh-huh. herbs for flavoring savory things. I like Mexican oregano too, but it, we're you're really talking about an ancient, ancient herb that does go all the way back to and before uh, probably into well into pre-biblical times. Wow. And what what do you use it for? It a lot of times I will just use it in a vinaigrette. I'll I'll use a, uh, a citrus or a, a, some type of acid, citrus or vinegar, uh, uh, an oil. Whether if I want a robust oil, I use olive oil, uh-huh. avocado oil, and it's my favorite herb to add into the vinaigrette for any kind of salad, 
it's a, a really good component of um, a blend that I would do as a paste on something like a roast, like oh, a, a chicken right, 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 or a turkey, right, right. Yeah, exactly. yeah, or or a pork roast, yeah, um, and uh, you know just and and sprinkled fresh into um, salads. If I'm going to make mm-hmm. um, chicken salad, you know, for a sandwich, I might put a little bit of oh, it in there. Oh yeah, yeah. Wow. You know what? We need to get you back on the show in the future and talk about <laughs> talk about all the great things you can do with the herbs because. Oh. Yeah, because the other part of it is if you grow it, eat it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So what projects are you currently working on? Well, I'm just I'm happy to say I just finished. It was a while. It took me a while, but I just finished the 2017 month by month wall calendar. It's just been released by my publisher. Nice. So I'm excited to get that out there. And, and uh, I just I got it. The tool was necessary i think because most of the gardening information if somebody decides they want to go up to the internet or they want to look for something Uh on how to grow whatever's um, most of it's written for four season um uh regions not for the desert so this this calendar is specifically for the desert southwest and the deep south uh, usda zone 9b and above nice Nice. So how can we get a hold of one of those if we live in 9B uh, or above? Uh, right. Uh, so it, the, uh, the publisher link site is lulu, mm-hmm. uh, spelled just like it sounds, L-U-L-U dot com forward slash herbs, H-E-R-B-S, the number two mm-hmm. and the letter U. Oh. And that takes, that takes the listener to my publisher's page on my um calendar and book perfect perfect and we'll we'll have that on the show notes page as well so people will be able to find you so i'm going to shift on you now and i'd like for you to talk about a time you failed how you overcame that failure and what you might have learned from it well i think i've talked a little bit about it i was so new to the idea when I moved here about how to grow in the desert. It's the same thing that other, you know, all newbies to the desert uh, experience is, uh, you know, what do you grow here? How do you grow? And I started basically saying, well, if, if, uh, if I put something over here, let me see what it does. And I kind of built failure into my garden journey. Um, I used to talk about gardening as experimenting, but my friend Suzanne Velarde <laughs> said she called it a journey, and I like that better yeah, because that's go. what it is. So I would, you know, experiment with putting it over here. No, that didn't work. Mm-hmm. Putting it over there. Okay, that worked better. Um, seeing what conditions uh, it uh, needed. Um, if I found something new, I would try three or four plants in three totally different areas. Um, I might even put them in friends' gardens to be if they didn't oh. if I didn't have a, a, a thing. Nice. So I hey, I'm a friend. Did. I'm a friend. <laughs> I could be your friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so and and, and so uh, you know, it, over the course of the years and the decades, I came to be able to see how uh, similar things would do, and and the suggestions. By the way, getting back to the typical four season areas gardening principles you know a lot of them don't apply because most of it's about the soil temperature here in the daylight hours Uh not necessarily how hot or cold it is because we can garden in for instance i um i grow horseradish oh yeah and and, but it's planted the opposite time yep then you would plant it in the four season garden yep exactly so that's basically it. I kind of built in failure, and from the failures, and as I mentioned before, all of the green death, uh, I've learned a lot, and I can share that. Nice. So what do you consider your biggest success? I'd have to say that people look to me for information. Uh-huh. That blows me away every time <laughs> somebody comes up and that. says, I I saw your stuff, and I think it's just wonderful. You have helped me so much. I just, I walk away glowing. Yeah. So I think that my success is that I've been able to show people that you can garden here year-round successfully and grow some or more or most of your own food. And I've been able to help people who were struggling 
get past their initial concern mm-hmm. and uh, and failures and go on to be successful or more successful. And that just, I think that's my biggest success is that I've helped people. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So what drives you? I would have to say, I've, I've, I was thinking about the things that do drive me and I came up with, My biggest concern is that people have a tendency to develop what I call, we we talk about monoculture in agriculture and gardening and farming and permaculture. Monoculture is growing one crop. Yep. I think that what what has happened to us, again, post- World War II uh-huh. and the and the thing about everybody has to get a college degree, everybody has to do, mm. you know become something or other, and I I've come up with a mem for it, mono skill mentality. That's what drives me. People don't think past going for a single mm. skill uh-huh. until they are hit with something like an economic downturn, the loss of a job. A disability all of a sudden all of that wonderful you're a lawyer you can't do it anymore you're a doctor your hand won't work yeah these you know people uh, you're a mechanic um, and but you don't know how to really take care of a financial business if you wanted to own your own garage yeah and so I think the thing that drives me is that people have become tied to the idea that there's always somebody out there who can either sell them or do for them something that they want to have done Mm -hmm. rather than look inside and see what they are capable of doing so that's what drives me i i i become increasingly more concerned about people who always have to rely on somebody else to do something Mm -hmm. even if it's even if it's growing a crop yeah Growing a tomato, I I want people to think past their single skill and find out what they can do. You know, if you're a lawyer, I think they ought to learn carpentry. If they're a doctor, they ought to learn uh, you know electricity. And everyone should be growing some or all of their own food. Yeah. I am so on board with you about the some or all of your own food. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So I'm all about education, and I have to know: is there one book? that has been influential for you in this process? There's actually been two, but the primary one was Rosalind Creasy's Edible Landscaping. Mm-hmm. I read it first way back in the 80s or, oh, early, wow. or late 70s, yeah. something like that. Yeah, and I loved it. I mean, it, 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 was, it was the start of my looking to grow stuff, you know, to put flavor back in, mm. in, in our foods. And, mm-hmm. and I'm reading uh, voraciously this book, and I realize that it's wonderful except, and this is where I was both, uh, I, want, I loved it and I was disappointed. Mm. It was for a four-season climate. Oh, right. Of course it is. It didn't, it didn't apply to the desert. Mm-hmm. So everything about when to garden and how to garden and, and even to a certain extent, you know, the, the issues about pests and um, they didn't have to worry about watering, you know, that right. type of stuff. So none of, none of the things that, uh, that is applicable to a desert gardener was addressed in <clears throat> Rosalind's book. As wonderful as it was, Hers was the uh, impetus for me to really get into researching. I research Mm. constantly. Right. I'm I'm self-educated. I'll be honest. I've never taken courses for it uh, because I'm a test phobic. (laughs) And so I just I rely on the world's largest library, or or I buy books. You know, the internet. I I research constantly, always looking to. Mm -hmm verify and re-verify whatever it is I'm focused on. Yeah. The second book that it really impressed me and again kind of disappointed me a little bit was Barbara Kingsolver's um, Animal Vegetable Miracle. Everything that she wrote about was exactly what we in permaculture and sustainability want to do. We want it all. Yeah. Except that Kingsolver left Tucson because she said, you can't do this in the desert. Oh, interesting. And I, and I said to myself, no, we can. We can, yeah. 
I, you so, know, it's a funny thing happened a few years ago, actually, right after I did my permaculture design course, so this would have been 92 or 93. I was giving a talk somewhere and this guy stuck up his hand and he said, you can't do permaculture in the desert. And, you know, for me, per permaculture is the art and science of working in the flow of nature. Mm -hmm. So why can't you work in the flow of nature in the desert? So, you know, I've heard I've heard that before. Yeah. And well, you know, people and, and it, it gets back to one of the one of the other scary things about somebody else can do it for you. Yeah. One of the things that I'm seeing a little bit more and more, and particularly because we have a drought issue here mm -hmm. right now in the, in the southwest, is there are people who are now saying, we don't need to give water to farmers because we can import <laughs> every single food item that people want. Scary, isn't it? Very scary. Yeah. Very scary. And that's the same mentality that says you can't garden in the desert. You right. can garden in the desert gardening wisely rain capture and uh, no-till gardening and mm. mulching and I mean there's all sorts of, I mean it was systems. done for thousands of years right exactly exactly including in the Middle East yeah as in the Bible <laughs> right exactly so what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners I would say just do it don't be afraid of you know, making a mistake or, you know, I, I get sad every time I lose a plant. Yeah. Uh, and But don't be afraid of making a mistake. I don't think that if you discover that you did something wrong or it didn't work, that that's a wrong. Yeah. You know, that's that's a path that, you know, doesn't work. Exactly. You know, that's the way I, I would say just do it. Mm -hmm. Give it a try and see what happens and the other thing is everybody's garden is different the, this valley in, is in particular is mm -hmm. so wonderful because the zones range from one neighborhood to another uh, there are zones even within my own garden uh, oh, yeah. I can have an 8 degree temperature difference from one side of the garden to the other I can have frost in the winter on one side and not in the other yeah isn't that amazing isn't that amazing? So just, you know, get out there, get your fingers dirty, and um, fall in love with gardening. <laughs> love that. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show today and sharing your experience with us, Catherine. It has been a treat getting to chat with you. Well, thank you, Greg. I really appreciated the invitation. Yeah. And um, just uh, everybody, get your growing on. <laughs> so how can our listeners get a hold of you, find your books like that? Um, I have a website. Um, okay. It's www.herbstoyou.net. H E R B S, the number two, the letter U, dot net. Perfect. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. Decades ago, I started growing food in my front and backyard, and I realized that my mission in life is to inspire and empower others to grow their own nutrient-dense, healthy, organic food. Because of this, a lot of people have come to me with their gardening questions over the years, and that got me thinking, what if we put together a community that would help budding gardeners blossom? So I finally made the idea a reality with my Urban Farm U member program. Each month, your membership includes three live online events, a monthly class, a chit-chat with an expert, and a monthly coaching session, plus access to the experts on our member page and a significant discount on our signature courses. I'm deeply committed to transforming our global food system, and I do this by empowering you to grow your own food. The Urban Farm Membership Program is a simple way to get going. Please join me in transforming your food system today. To learn more, go to urbanfarmmembership.org or text membership to 33444. That's urbanfarmmembership.org or text membership to 33444. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen three days a week for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. 
In the words of Vincent van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.